Good morning and good evening and everything in between. How is everybody doing on this beautiful, beautiful Thursday? But this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice. We will always rejoice. Praise God. He loves us. Praise God. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and for me. That is our hope. That is our encouragement. That gets us through each and every day, regardless of the situation or circumstance. And of course, it sure does make the day that much more brighter and cheerier when we have somebody like Wendy singing and Steve giving a message from his word. Are you ready? Are you ready to take in what God has for you and me and to be used to strengthen us and to just give us that much more wisdom and knowledge and how to handle whatever comes our way? Let's pray. Precious Lord, we put the day before you or we, as of this evening, reflecting on how the day went. But knowing, Lord, that you will be with us as we sleep or as we're going through every minute of every second of, of the life we breathe. Lord, we love you. We thank you again for sending your son, Jesus. Be with Wendy as she sings. May it, I have no doubt it's going to minister to our hearts, pick up our spirits. And, of course, just taking in all that God has shown Steve through his word, through your word. And, Lord, how we can just, just learn and glean so much. How it does how it does strengthen us, how it does give us that much more insight or just what's going on in the world to know that you are a God that never slumbers or sleeps and that you have this. It is going to be okay. You are a good and awesome loving God and we praise you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Here's Wendy. Hi, sing with me. I know whom I have believed. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in brought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at noon or night day fair, nor if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. Hello, everybody. What a blessing it is to be here today. What a great, great song, Wendy. Thank you so much. You ever hear a worship song and it just sort of just goes right through you? Well, that's what it's like sometimes listening to Miss Wendy sing here. And my goodness gracious, my, my, my. Well, hello and welcome to the Canaveral Port Ministry Ways to Hope Chapel. I am Chaplain Steve McCrory and it's my privilege today to lead us in an examination of 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Now, before I get started today, I just want to kind of take a little bit of a moment here. Um, you ever just make such a stupid mistake and you just can't believe 
you, you ever did it. It's like you did something without even thinking. Well, we're going to kind of see something like that in today's message. So I hope you'll just hang in there with me today as we get through this. It's not a very big passage, but there's some real depth here that I think all of us can relate to in one fashion or another. As I mention every week, when we study Scripture, it's good to know a bit of the context, or at least a little bit, of what's going on before, during, and after what we're studying. And as we pick up from last week, and this was a big transition. I know some of you say, oh, it's Thursday, or is it Tuesday? What day is it, right? Yeah, it's Thursday, at least here at this time when we're, when we're broadcasting. And I've changed my days of presentation from Tuesdays to Thursdays because of another conflict that I have with, with scheduling. So as always, the ministry here is always so accommodating and making it just so easy to, to be able to serve the Lord. So as we pick up from last week, and uh, we completed... Um, our examination of the book of Ruth. And my last presentation was Ruth in chapter 3, and we looked at Ruth calling on Boaz and, and the events at the threshing floor. And since then, we've completed the book of Ruth. It's a little book. And we learned in chapter 4 that Boaz married Ruth, and a list of descendants of Boaz was presented that leads to David, which eventually leads to Jesus. That's really awesome. Um, and that, of course, leads us into 1 Samuel. And then in chapter 1, we read of the birth and the dedication of Samuel. And then in chapter 2, we looked at the prayer of praise from Samuel's mother, Hannah. We also learned of Eli, the priest who had two sons who were wicked, which was followed by a sobering warning of Eli that was to become his family. That what was to become of his family. Oops. Uh, and that leads us into chapter 3. This chapter is so awesome as we learn of God's calling to Samuel. Soon, Samuel was recognized across all of Israel as a prophet. Is that better? A little closer? <laughs> no problem. Live broadcast. You can't get better than this. This is awesome. This is almost like having the boom mic come in from above. It's just fun. So, okay. So, here we'll go. And uh, so, that leads us to, uh, to today's passage. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, where the Philistines capture the ark. But as always, let's speak ahead a little bit, because um, later in chapter 4, we're going to read of the death of Eli, and then in chapter 5, we'll learn of the ark in, uh, in the hands of the Philistines. <laughs> That's not going to work out well for them at all. That's going to be followed by the Philistines returning the ark in chapter 6. And then in chapter 7, Samuel leads Israel to victory over the Philistines. And then in chapter 8, we will mark a transition where Israel requests a king. But let's hop back to our passage for today. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. As I typically do, I read through the New Living Translation. Um, it's just, it's a... Um, um, it, it, it's a format that's just a little bit easier to digest for people whose English might be their second or third, even fourth language, and we like to make it easy as we can to understand. So, now, in this case, chapter 3 has a transition into chapter 4 that I'm just, just compelled to bring just a couple verses of the end of chapter 3 to tie chapter 4 with, with some, some fluidity. So, um, I'm going to start with just the last couple of verses of chapter 3, and then I'll, I'll, I'll note where we're moving on. So in chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, as Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. And all Israel, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and gave messages to Samuel there at the tabernacle. Now we're moving into chapter 4, verse 1. And Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Aphek. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Then they said, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. So they sent men to Shiloh to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Heaven, the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim, 
Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were also there with the Ark of the Covenant. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into their camp, their shout of joy was so loud it made the ground shake. What's going on, the Philistines asked. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because of the Ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp, they cried. This is a disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. Help! Who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we will become the Hebrew slaves just as they have been ours. Stand up like men and fight. So the Philistines fought desperately, and Israel was defeated again. Their slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tents. The Ark of God was captured, and Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were killed. And that concludes the passage for today. So you see some really bad things going on here, right? So in review, the Ark is captured. In verses 1 and 2, Israel is defeated before the Philistines. During this time, there was no great world power such as Egypt or Assyria seeking to dominate the region. So Israel's battles were waged against her near neighbors such as the Moabites, the Ammonites, or here the Philistines. Israel competed on more equal terms with Moab and Ammon, but the Philistines had Greek military equipment such as helmets and shields and chain mail armor and swords and spears, making the Philistines more formidable opponents. The Philistines were the first people in Canaan to process iron, and they made the most of it. The Philistines were an immigrant people from the military aristocracy of the island of Crete. Small numbers of Philistines were in the land at the time of Abraham, but they came in larger numbers soon after Israel came to Canaan from Egypt. This was a difficult period for Israel. Never did time seem more hopeless than when Samuel arose. The Philistines strengthened not merely by a constant influx of immigrants, but by the importation of arms from Greece, and were fast reducing Israel to the condition of a subject race. It's important to understand that this battle was not initiated by Samuel. There are manuscripts that make it clear the Philistines started this conflict. Nevertheless, the battle ended in disaster. As we move into verses 3 and 4, the elders of Israel respond with a superstitious trust in the ark. The elders of Israel, after the battle with the Philistines, decided the next battle could be won if they took the ark of the covenant with their soldiers. Now, the ark of the covenant was the representation of the throne of God in Israel kept in the most holy place of the tabernacle, and the people never saw it. Only the high priest entered and saw the ark, and that was only once a year. The elders wanted to take this representation of the throne of God out of the Holy of Holies. It could be moved when the tabernacle was to be moved. However, they covered it and brought it with them into battle. They hoped it would give confidence that God was really with them. The ark went into battle before. The ark went in front of the marchers around the city of Jericho. Moses told the priests to lead the ark into battle against the Midianites back in the book of Numbers. And later, uh, Saul would bring the ark into battle as we see further downstream in 1 Samuel, as did David in 2 Samuel. The elders rightly sensed they needed God's help to win the battle, but they were wrong in the way they sought help. Instead of humbly repenting and seeking God, they turned to methods that God never approved. They only cared if it worked. They believed the presence of the ark would make God work for them. Some suggested that Israel's idea was that God should be forced to fight for them. If he was not willing to do it for their sake, he would have to do it for his honor's sake. No doubt, it seemed like a brilliant suggestion. They were probably pleased to arrive at such a great solution. 
They regarded the ark as the ultimate good luck charm and believed that they could not lose with it there. They looked to the ark to save them, not to the Lord. Instead of attempting to get right with God, these Israelites set out about devising superstitious means of securing the victory over their foes. In this respect, many of us have imitated them. We think of a thousand inventions, but yet we neglect one thing that's very needful. We forget the main matter, which is to enthrone God in our lives and to seek to do His will by faith in Jesus Christ. There are plenty of Christians like these elders who, when they find themselves beaten by the world and the devil, puzzle their brains to invent all sorts of reasons for God's smiting, except the true one, their own departure from him. Anyway, as we proceed into verse 5 and Israel's confidence in the Ark of the Covenant, someone passing by Israel's camp would think something tremendous was happening. Certainly, this would be considered a great church service, and many would think Israel really trusted God. But for all the appearances, it was really nothing. All the noise and excitement meant nothing because it wasn't grounded in God's truth. The Israelites probably felt they were better than the Philistines because the Philistines were pagans, worshiping false gods. Yet, the Israelites thought and acted just like pagans thinking they could manipulate God and force him into doing what they wanted him to do. And that never works out. Had they humbled themselves and prayed devoutly and fervently for success, they would have likely been heard and saved. Their shouting proved vanity. Moving into verses 6 through 9, we learn of the Philistines' fear of the Ark of the Covenant. We should compliment the Philistines for understanding that the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God on their knowledge of Israel's history. They knew it was unusual for the Israelites to bring the ark into battle, and they knew the God of Israel had defeated the Egyptians. Even though they did not understand much about God, the Philistines recognized the superiority of the God of Israel. Yet, they did not submit to God, but simply became determined to fight against him all the more. If they really believed their gods were greater than the God of Israel, they should not have been worried. If they believed the God of Israel was greater than their gods, they should have submitted to him. We, like them, often know God is greater and deserves our submission. Yet, we often resist God as well instead of submitting to him. Knowledge wasn't their problem. Submission to God was. The presence of the ark did not make the Philistines feel like giving up. It scared them, but it didn't make them feel like giving up. Instead, it made them feel they had to fight all the harder to overcome the odds. They had the courage of desperate men. Godless Philistines can teach us something. Christians need to show more of this courage. Instead of giving up when things look bad, we should trust the Lord and fight all the harder and decide we will not give up. Courage and persistence win many battles, even sometimes for the wrong side. Closing today's passage in verses 10 through 11, the ark goes into battle and Israel is defeated worse than before. There were at least three reasons for this great defeat. First, the Philistines fought with the courage of desperate men. Second, the Israelites felt the battle would be easy with the ark of the covenant there, and maybe didn't try as hard. Finally, God did not bless Israel's superstitious belief in the power of the ark instead of the power of God. We often make the same mistake, believing that if God is with us, we don't need to try as hard. We think if God is on our side, the work might be easy, and that may not be true at all. As it turned out, God did not feel obligated to bless the Israelites just because they took the ark into battle. He wouldn't allow his arm to be twisted by the superstitions of the Israelites. God is a person, not a genie, to be summoned at the will of man. Not only did Israel lose, they lost far worse than they did before taking the ark into battle. The loss which prompted them to take the ark resulted in the death of about 4,000 men of Israel. 
With the ark, more than seven times as many men of Israel were killed than without it. In the late 1970s, um, a, a five-line inscription was found on a grain silo in, in the ruins of that area. When deciphered, it was found to contain a Philistine account of this battle. The capture of the ark, even specifically mentioning the name of Hophni, the priest, one of Eli's sons. This is the earliest known extra-biblical reference to an Old Testament event. The Ark of the Covenant being captured was worse than just losing a battle. The very thing they thought would win the battle was captured. Israel made an idol of the Ark, and God often deals with our idolatry by taking the idol away. As we see here, we can make good things idols. There was nothing wrong with the ark itself. God commanded them to make it, and it was important to Israel. He told them to put the tablets of the law, a jar of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded in the ark. Yet, even a good thing like the ark can be made into an idol, and God will not tolerate our idols. Even though the ark was captured, God was still on the throne in heaven and guiding these circumstances for his glory. Israel thought they could ignore the God of the Ark and find deliverance in the Ark of God. See, they have it all backwards, right? God showed he was greater than the Ark. Lastly, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. The priests who were supposed to supervise the Ark were killed in the battle. God promised the two sons of Eli would die on the same day as proof of his ultimate judgment on the house of Eli now the proof of judgment came. In reflection, during the long period of the judges, the Israelites as a whole had adopted an increasingly pagan attitude towards Yahweh, God. They felt they could satisfy him with simply formal worship, that they could secure his help with offerings rather than humility. They were treating the ark the same way they treated God. They believed the ark's presence among them in battle would ensure victory. Hophni and Phinehas, in keeping with their character, had shown little concern for the ark, even permitting the people to enter the Holy of Holies and take the ark out to battle. This was sacrilege of the first order. The Holy of Holies in the tabernacle was not to be entered by anyone except the high priest, and in this case that would have been Eli, and this only once a year. And surely the ark was to be carried about the land and into battle like an idol of the heathen, never. In church work today, many people are equally as superstitious. They think that God, as it were, is in a box. They say, look at this method. It's a nice little package deal. It's a success in a box. This method will solve our problem. Many people are moving in that direction today. My friend, that is not being spiritual. That is being superstitious. It is common for those that have estranged themselves from the vitals of religion to discover a great fondness for the rituals and external observances of it. We eventually all learn what Israel discovered in battle against the Philistines. Having the paraphernalia of God and having God are not the same. The paraphernalia that modern believers sometimes rely on in place of God include things like a crucifix, a picture of Jesus, or a family Bible positioned conspicuously in the home but seldom read. Others base their hope of spiritual success on a spiritually strong spouse, a regular church attendance, or even the daily reading of the Bible. These things, as good as they may be, are no substitute for a vital personal relationship with God. In Samuel, we have a record of how commitment to the will of God results in blessing for individuals, groups of individuals, and whole nations. This commitment should rest on an appreciation for God's initiative in reaching out to undeserving sinners in grace. We also see how disregard for God's word because of a failure to appreciate God's grace inevitably leads to a blasting, a curse from God. These lessons are not new, 
The book of Samuel are not emphasizing these things for the first time in Scripture. The book of Joshua is a positive lesson that people who trust and obey God might succeed. They might even accomplish supernatural feats and prosper. The book of Judges gives the other side of that coin. People who disregard God will likely fail, become unproductive, suffer defeat, and sometimes die prematurely. The book of Samuel continues the emphasis begun in Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy that clarified, namely, that our response to God's grace determines our destiny. In closing, it is essential that we have a vital personal relationship with God. The Bible perfectly demonstrates this. Over and over, we see that we are, when we are in step with God's will, we shall succeed in his purposes. However, we also see that when we seek our will and our purposes apart from God's, we eventually fail and often miserably. So today, how do we get into alignment with God's will for us? First, we need to acknowledge that we sin and need forgiveness of that sin to have the relationship with the Lord that we need so much. The Bible says that we're all guilty of having done, thought, or said bad things, which the Bible calls sin. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The result or consequence of sin is death and spiritual separation from God, but God loves us. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place for our sins. Jesus died in our place so that we could have peace in an everlasting relationship and be with him forever. Through Christ alone, we can find and be lifted to victorious peace with God. But we must receive God as our Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of our sins and restored relationship with him. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, if you openly declare Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. The cost of our salvation has already been paid in the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. The Bible tells us in John 1, verse 12, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Will we be counted as God's children? We can be, but it's up to us to make a stand, to decide. It's up to us to be decisive and move into action. We can move past our guilt, our doubt, and our troubles and accept God's mercy and grace, restore our broken relationship with him, and live lives according to his will. It's up to us to respond to God's grace that determines our destiny and embrace the gift that God offers us through his son Jesus. The Bible clearly tells us Jesus is the only way to having peace with God. Jesus himself calls to us when he said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We can't earn this forgiveness of our sins and restore our relationship with God on our own or by just trying to be good. Not any of us knows with any certainty when our time here will end. Now is the time to embrace God's love for us. To be in a restored relationship with God, we must acknowledge that we sin and need to be forgiven. We need to trust it and profess Jesus Christ as Lord, that he paid for our sins on the cross and was raised from the dead according to Scripture. We need to turn from our worldly, sinful ways and embrace God's holy and pure ways. Would you like to receive him today, right now? There is no need to wait. We are to come as we are. Jesus knows you and loves you, and he is knocking on the door of your heart right now. Will you let him in? Will you restore your relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ? As I do every week, as I close, I'm going to offer a prayer that you may repeat along with me if you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You may follow along out loud, quietly, silently. Jesus hears you. So I invite you to pray along with me. Dear God, 
I confess that I am a sinner and need forgiveness of my sins. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead according to Scripture. Jesus, right now, I invite you into my heart, into my life, to be my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Jesus, help me to turn from my ways, my sin. Help me to turn to your pure and holy ways and follow your will for my life. Jesus, thank you for loving me so much. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. And that concludes our study for this week, or, or my examination here of this passage. If you said that prayer with me today for the first time, please reach out to us here at the ministry. We have materials that we would like to get into your hands. If you said this uh, prayer along with me today for the second, third, hundredth time, it doesn't matter. You just know you want to get realigned uh, in, your, in your walk with the Lord. Please let us know here as well about that because we would like to help you. We have materials. We have lots of ways, resources that we can um, reach back out to you and, and help you in your walk. Um, if, if you like these presentations, please press the like button there on, on that Facebook page. If, if you uh, would even be so inspired, I encourage you to share these messages. These messages come out pretty much every day as we walk through the Bible. And, and the further out that these can go, the more impact they can have. And we don't know where the impact is going to happen or where it's going to fall. But we know that everybody has a part, everybody has a role, and you can play a part in this process. So if you would, please like, share these things so these messages can just go out further. If there is anything else that we might be able to do for you, again, don't hesitate to ask. And I believe that's pretty much it. So until next week, I just hope that you would um, just Keep the faith, walk the walk, and, and just know that Jesus is coming and that this COVID is going to be behind us all soon. So please stay safe and blessings.